Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. And we are so excited to have Scott Jelenic back. And he is the author of the book, The Slow Flip. And we're so excited to have you. Welcome, Scott. Thank you for having me once again. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So first of all, if you're here, you have to listen to part one and part two that he did. This is our advanced edition. Okay. And so a lot of times when people think of a slow flip, what the traditional uh, definition of a slow flip is, is someone who maybe purchases in a house, they live in it for maybe two to five years. They do all the renovations and the repairs on their own. They take the time and then they have the intention of selling it for a profit. That is not what we're talking about. So Scott, give us the definition of your, what you're talking about when we're talking about slow flips. So my definition is actually the only definition. The other people that might have put something out there, they make up what they want. But anyway, what we say is it's selling a house as slowly as possible for the fastest possible path to wealth. And I always try and specify that it is not the fastest path to a check. You know, wholesaling, you know, or flipping a house is a lot faster to a, a check, but it's the fastest path to wealth. And by that, I mean more money coming in monthly than we have going out. And, um, and so we buy them and we sell them with long-term owner financing. And I know we've gone over it in the first two podcasts, but just the, uh, the short version for you, Chantel. So how much do you personally make per month now on all of these properties and all the things that you're making per month to kind of get people excited about doing this? So we have, uh, we're bringing in just under a hundred thousand dollars a month right now from slow flips, but I have 178 of them now. And so there's a lot more room that it's going to grow over the next five years because they're all bought on, they're all bought on five-year mortgages. So right now I have about 90 that are free and clear. I have 20 more that come free and clear, 24 more this December. And then they're all sporadic, you know, every, every month, every couple months, there's another one that come that gets paid off. So it's okay. it's much bigger money than I did when I did rentals and when I'm flipping because it's passive every month on the first we get paid again. Awesome. So let's talk about someone. I know your model is try to buy properties around the 50,000, 75,000, even 100,000, but we have people on this call um, that have said, listen, I only want to buy a property that's in my market. And, uh, you know, I had a guy in Montana that says around me, the cheapest house you can possibly get is $150,000 to $175,000. So that makes sense to me, right? Like if someone says, I want to start this, but I want to start it local because I know my market, but the cheapest price I could get is maybe $200,000. How would you use your model? I know that's not your traditional of what you really want, but let's say if someone does a 200,000 or a 300,000, that's the cheapest they can get, walk us through what that looks like. So there's two sides to the slow flip and that's the buy side and the sell side, right? And the buy side is where we buy them and buy them on five-year mortgages to get them paid off. So there's no money out of pocket and our tenant buyer pays it off in five years. The sell side is where we're selling it on a 30-year mortgage. We sell it for what I call super retail and we sell it on a 30-year mortgage. You can do it with anything. Like I think I've told you, Chantal, my highest price house is 875000 But that's not ideal because the ideal slow flip we want to have paid off in five years. So what I would tell that person, if they're in a market in Montana or Long Island, where I'm from, you can't buy anything under 500000 is you can still do the sell side if you wanted to. If you basically wanted to be a landlord but didn't want the landlord headaches, you can still do the sell side. However, if you are interested in building this freedom, this wealth, then you're going to buy outside of your market. And I know people hate that. And I hated it for years until I, ste I stepped my toe into it. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, it's not. A I was afraid. I'm like, how could I buy outside of my market? And now I, I think I was telling you, I have about 70, 65, 70 houses I've never even seen. And um, and because we're we're not landlords anymore, we're not fixing stuff. We're not falling in love with our properties. We're just doing the paperwork. We're just the you know we're just shuffling papers. Is all. They're not houses to me anymore so much as they are mortgages. They're just paperwork. So I want you to walk someone through kind of a checklist, and we created a checklist as well. So if someone wants to go to joincanzel.com slash slow flip, we kind of took uh, some of your things and and made it more. Uh, in detail, but I want you to talk about, let's say someone wants to find an investment property to flip. 
Like, what would you, let's say they're like, I went on the MLS, there's nothing there for good prices. You know, do you suggest having, you know, the bandit signs or walk us through kind of the, the whole process from start to finish? So again, it depends if we're doing your local market or if we're doing a virtual market. So in my let's local market, local. so in my local market, I primarily do direct mail and I do the internet. However, I'm not just a slow flipper. I also wholesale. So I don't know that I would do that if I was just looking for slow flips because it's expensive. The, the marketing is expensive. And if you're just buying slow flips, you're not going to get that return. So um, in my local market, I, I, I market for all the houses, but then most of them will wholesale and the ones that fit the slow flip criteria I keep. In the Midwest markets, they're readily available. So we, you know, we can buy in, in Illinois and Missouri. They buy them in Ohio, Alabama, Kentucky, um, Tennessee. And, and there in those markets, they can just buy them right off the market and they get them in the numbers that work. But if you're in a higher price market like we are, we get them through marketing. So with the bandit signs, like if someone went to dirtcheapsigns.com and they wrote something like, we buy houses for cash for a fair price, call me at, you know, 555-1212. Um, do you feel like those signs still work? Do people still call on those signs? They absolutely work. I don't do them anymore, um, but that's more or less just out of laziness. But um, but a lot of my people still do them. They still work. They still get deals from them. I always ask when I have one of my coaching students tell me they're working a deal. The first question I always ask is, where'd you get the lead? And you'll be surprised how many still get them from Bandit Signs. They, they still work. And they're $2 a sign. They, um, they work. And they're a very low-cost, effective way to get leads. Well, in your book, uh, the slow flip. And by the way, I think your book is so well written. It, it, when you read it, you guys, it literally sounds just like Scott. He's done such a great job of writing this book. I, I give it a 10 out of 10. I give it like a hundred out of 10. Like you did such a great job on it. Um, but one of the things you talked about is, you know, when you're selling the property, writing a hand, writing it handwritten and writing it as messy as possible actually yes. gets you the best return. But if you're buying the bandit signs to find a property where you're saying we buy houses for cash fast and fair, call me, would you order those from like dirtcheapsigns.com or would yeah. you, would you handwrite them? Which, which so works better? When I'm buying, I use the professional pre-printed yellow and black. We buy houses and a phone number selling. I use the white ones with a magic marker, misspelled, horrible looking. And the reason is simple is that when you're, when you're looking to sell your house, you want a professional to come buy it, right? That's what you want. Somebody that you feel is professional and knows what they're doing. When you're looking to buy a house, they don't want a professional. They want a mom and pop, somebody that they think is going to, you know, they're not going to check my credit or they're going to let me talk to them about why I should be able to keep my dog or whatever it may be. And so it, they work the opposite. When I'm selling, I like to use the handwritten. And when I'm buying, I want to use professional looking signs. Now, if you're doing the Google AdWords, you know, I've had, you know, Matt Saunders, who's been on the show as well. He says he's paying about $300 per Google AdWord. I mean, not per Google AdWords, per lead, per lead that comes through from yep. doing the Google AdWords. What is the price that you'd be paying for yours when you're doing them? It, it's Google about that. And this is the part that shocks a lot of people. It, you know, internet's expensive, but it could take up to 20 leads to get a deal. And so, the, again, this is this is why I don't recommend it if you're just doing slow flips, because I might be out six grand before I get a deal. Now, mind you, on that deal, I might make 20, 30, 50 grand, but that's wholesaling it. If I'm just doing slow flips, if I'm out that much and then nothing's coming back except in a monthly, it wouldn't it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't be cost effective. But it would make sense if someone was a real estate agent, because then they could go to them and say, all right, well, if you want it for cash, I can give you we this, can but yep. we can also list it so they can get it. Absolutely. As an agent, well. everything changes because you always have that that added back up. If they don't want to sell to you, if they do want to sell just because they don't want to sell for your price, they can still sell on the open market. So as an agent, you have added you have added things you can do to make value out of those leads. So talk about the direct mail. I, I know a lot of people say that direct mail is completely dead. Talk about how, what neighborhoods you decide to do when you're doing direct mail and what are you paying for that and where are you going to do the direct mail to get the 
get the uh, investments properly. So this would be completely different. You as an agent, you can do direct mail pretty much on any house, right? Because any house needs to be sold. But as investors, we try and we have, we use a company called REI Print Mail and they will scour, they do based on, we can do free and clear properties only. We can do free and clear with an out-of-state owner, which those work out really well for us. We can do ones that have um, tax liens on them because they're it's all public record. So we can only market to tax liens, only market to ones that have um, code violations. And sometimes we stack the list. So we only want free and clear with an out-of-state owner with code violations. So it'll be multiple different um, touch points on it. And then they'll compile the list. And so we're mailing to a more specific group, whereas an agent, you can mail basically any house can be sold. As an investor, we can only buy them if they have significant equity and some pain points, usually either code violations or they're out of the area, bad tenants, evictions in process. So if you had, so so far we've talked about doing the bandit signs. And when I say bandit signs, those are just those signs that you put right in the ground, the reiprintmail.com and then Google AdWords. If someone is just kind of starting out, Put rank those in order, which one's kind of the best bang for your buck of which ones you would start doing in one, two, three is the best. So if you're just starting out, it depends on your money situation. Generally, when I have people starting that have no money, I always advise them bandit signs, bandit signs, networking and doing your social media because that's all free or near free bandit signs are two dollars each. Um, it takes money to do direct mail. I always tell people, I said, direct mail is your most, we get our most leads ever from direct mail, but it's also the most expensive. And so it's a, it's a trade-off. Bandit signs take time and energy, but very low cost. Direct mail takes no time, no energy, but it's high cost. And um, so it's, it's, that's the trade-off is you can either do the work yourself and save money or you can outsource it. And now it, it costs you more money. So, All right, so for, for me now, I'm, I'm strictly direct mail and the internet. Um, because again, I've, you know, I've gotten lazy and I don't want to be running around on the streets anymore, but when I, if I was brand new starting, then yeah, that's probably what I would do. All right. So let's say you get a great deal on the property. Let's talk about marketing and publishing it. And what are those timelines looking like? So let's say you bought a property and let's, let's just do an easy number with a hundred thousand. So let's say you found a property for a hundred thousand here, uh, in Hampton roads, what would be all the, what would you market that property for and what would the steps to market it be? So I'm going to just, instead of using a hypothetical, I'll give you a real one. So I recently just purchased one in Norfolk. Um, so it's in our local market in Norfolk, Virginia, and I paid 66,000 for it, which is more than I normally like to pay, but it's a good neighborhood and it's a good house. Well, we sold it for in, you know, and, and I may have told you these numbers when we spoke last time, we sold it at 249,000 as is without doing any work. And mind you, this house hadn't been touched in 40, 50 years. It was a family house. It was inherited. We sold it at 249. We got $8,000 down and we got 1495 a month and they sold right away. So our, in, like, especially in Hampton roads, they don't last. I mean, throughout the day, they don't last for a full day. In the Midwest markets, they might last two or three weeks with a vacant unit. In our market here, they don't even make it through one day because what we're selling is the financing. The house comes with it. And so as much as somebody can say, I can find a better house at a better price, they can, but that one they got to pay cash for or they have to get a mortgage for it. Mine comes with the financing, which is why we sell them so quickly. Mm. Okay, so then let's just walk people through. So the next step is you're going to, are you taking interior and exterior photos of the property? Do pictures and video. Them? Yep. Yep. We post them and it's generally like within hours it's gone. And we do them. And I think I've told you this already. We do them on a first come first serve basis. So, and I know people hate this, especially if you're in regular rentals, it's all based on criteria and picking a qualified, pick the best qualified and a good tenant. We do it because of the down payment. We do it on a first come, first serve basis. And so they go really quick because a lot of times people have tried two and three and five other times to buy one from us and it's already gone by the time they come in. So when so they get in, they get trained to when something's available, they're racing over to be the one who gets it. I want you to tell the story that you told in the book about how people see the sign and it's like, you know, 200,000 this much down and, and they just repeat the sign. Do you tell that oh, story? Well, that's not even so much the sign. They do it on signs, but also if you, and this isn't just with houses, this is if you've ever sold anything online, anything, people will call the ad 
and basically read it to you. They'd be like, hi, I'm calling about the house at 123 Main Street. And I'll say, sure, what can I tell you? And they'll be like, I see here it says it's three bedrooms. Yep, it's three bedrooms. And I see here it says eight grand down and 1200 a month. Yep. And I see it says dogs are welcome. Yep. All right, let me think about it. I'll call you back. I'm like, what just happened here? You just basically called me and read me the ad and then said, you got to think about it. I'm like, and it's not just with houses. They do it with, if you run an ad for anything, it's amazing. People will call you and read it to you and then tell you they got to think about it and they'll call back. And I'm like, all right. So what is your solution to get rid of all of those phone calls? So we do a lot of different things, but and I know if you're dealing with conventional rentals, people will hate this. So the way we do it is we have a different phone number for every house. And mind you, I have 178 houses. I don't have 178 phone numbers because we only have we only need one for the vacant house. Right. So we only have a handful of them. And when the house is vacant, the ad and the signs will direct just to that house. And it's a message saying the house you're calling about is located at 123 Main Street. It's a three bedroom, one bath. It needs paint and carpet or a kitchen or whatever it may need. I'm selling it with owner financing with no money down and yeah, you know, I'm sorry, with 3000 down 875 a month or whatever the numbers are, feel free to walk around the property and look in the windows. And then if this looks like the house for you, then call me at, and then I give them another number, the Google voice number. When they call that number, I ask them, had you already walked around the house and looked at it? And if they tell me anything other than yes, I, I don't want any further conversation. Go look at the house first. And the reason is, and you guys know this being agents, people will literally set an appointment to go see it. And then when they show up, they'd be like, oh, no, I don't want to live in this neighborhood. And I'm like, well, you could have told me that before you drove out here to meet me. Right. Go and look at it on your own first. So then when they call, so the, yes, I've seen it. When can I get inside? I tell them, listen, I'm available anytime. Just give me an hour's notice. If I can't make it, my next door neighbor has a key and they will let you in. And um, so then they call. I do that so that I'm watching for them when they say they're going to go. So then they say, OK, how's tomorrow at one? Tomorrow's at one's fine. Call me at noon. So when they call, they tell me I'm heading over there and I tell them, OK, I'll see you at one. And I never see them, mind you. Then when they get there, they say, oh, yeah, I'm at the house. I say, oh, well, I couldn't make it. My neighbor just stepped out. But since you're already here, I'm going to go ahead and give you the lockbox code and let you let yourself in. So I walk them through it. The code is 2008. I tell them how to open up the box, open the door, take all the time you need, put the key back in the box, spin the dial and then give me a call as you're leaving. And I do this. 100% every single time. I never meet my people until they're at the office to fill out paperwork. And I never tell them that they're self-showing themselves. You know, people are like, oh, you're going to get robbed. They can kick in the walls. They can steal your appliances. Yes, they can. I've never had it happen. I've been doing this program since 2008. Not to say it couldn't happen tomorrow, but even if it did, it's well worth it for me. The thousands of hours I've saved would be worth it if someone stole my fridge or did something. And so I only ever actually meet them when they show up at the office with the money ready to do the paperwork. I don't actually meet people and show properties or or do all that other stuff that I used to do. So explain what you're doing, because now what I've heard you say is, you know, in your in our local market where you are, you're saying I can't find the deals. So now you're saying I'm going to Illinois and all these other places. How are you doing these same tactics if they can't even meet you to do the contract, how is that working out? So it's actually easier because when we're in remote markets, well, there's a lot more to it than we can speak about in 10 minutes. But when we're in remote markets, they're readily available. So we, the first thing we do is we run what we call a ghost ad, which will run an ad for a similar house, similar price points, similar everything, just to gauge the response. And then if we're getting 30, 40, 100 responses on it, then we'll let them know, sorry, that one's not available, but I'll let you know as soon as we close on the next one. So now when we get our next one, we don't even have to run an ad. We have these 100 names we just respond to and say we have another one now on 123 Main Street, right? Well, then we'll have, you know, you can get boots on the ground there. Generally, it costs me 100, 150 bucks. We'll find somebody in a local real estate investor group in that market and say, hey, I need someone to go take pictures and video and put a lockbox on the house. So they'll do that part of it. That's it. Pictures, video, a lockbox. Then they're out of it. My rest of it's still done over the phone. And then we'll have a local attorney in that market who they go in to fill out the paperwork. So they'll fill out the paperwork at an attorney's office. We don't have to do that, but I do that because it gives a level of comfort to the buyer. So they're not mailing random money across the, you know, because, you know, there's a lot of scams in the world. And then they're going to feel like, well, this guy's not even here and he's telling me to send my money, you know, and paperwork. So that's why we have a local attorney in every other market we're in who, They'll and how much to, are you paying for that for that attorney to do that? Two hundred fifty bucks typically. 
it, because it's not a real closing. It's just they basically just coming in to do an agreement for deed. And so they do it for 250 bucks. They also do our closings. That's really where they make their money. But they'll let our people come in and sign their 250 bucks. In Illinois, we pay a little bit more because in Illinois, they also have to be recorded. So we'll pay recording fees there, but it's not much more. I want to tell you, one of the reasons why I joined and I just love Canzel is that I can get 100% commission, I get revenue share, and I get stock. I am making thousands of dollars every single month in revenue share in stocks. And I now don't have to work nights and weekends on real estate anymore. You know, I've actually never been to a real estate agent's retirement party. And I want to be the first one that people are coming to at a young age. And I want to share with you some of my favorite resources. So if you go to joincanzel.com slash free, there's a couple that I want you to download. One is a 20 free lead generating PDF. It's gonna help you generate leads for free that you can download, as well as there's one on how to double your business. I don't want you to miss it. Go download it today. Joincanzel.com slash free. All right, I'm gonna read you a question from the audience. It says, I have a 1,400 square foot property that Zillow says the, it's estimated at 338,000 with his estimate of around $2,000 a month. I have put in about $10,000 to paint and fix the doors after a tenant left. This is not without any new appliances. I still need to put another $10,000 in it. I was wondering if this would still be a good idea to do a slow flip on this home, even though this week I just put $10,000 in. I figure if I have a 30 year loan, for 360,000 with 30,000 down payment, that would be about $3,300 for PI and then an additional $340 for TI, totaling around $3,700. My question is, can I find a buyer with this high amount, monthly amount, plus this amount for down payment? Like $30,000 is a lot of money for a property. So they're basically saying, she's like, look, I just found out about slow flips. I already put $10,000 in. I was renting it regular. Is this a good idea? And is anyone going to have $30,000 to put down. And if they had $30,000, why wouldn't they be able to just get a regular loan? So great question. So first of all, yes, there's more money out there than people realize. Putting $30,000 down is not a big deal. I think I told you on the 875 one I did, they put 60,000 down. And I was surprised how fast it went because I was stepping outside of my comfort zone with such a high dollar house. So the short answer is this, this wouldn't be my ideal slow flip based on the numbers. However, if you already own it, it's basically just up to you. Would you rather just collect a check or and not be a landlord anymore because the house may go up again over the next couple of years and you're going to be locked in at your price now? Or do you just want to be the bank and collect the payment? Um, so your other question, which was a really good one, if somebody has 30 grand or 50 grand or 100 grand, why wouldn't they just get a mortgage themselves? Well, that's easy to say when you're um, gainfully employed and have great credit, right? But there's plenty of people who are good people and they have money, but they, and I'm gonna give you a, for instance, they're contractors and they don't have, they get paid in cash or they own their own contracting business and their records aren't great. So when they go to a bank, the banks are, oh, I need to see everything. And they're like, well, I have plenty of money, but I don't have any of that. I don't have my tax returns current. I don't have you know, my record keeping the way it needs to be. And so we have plenty, I mean, we got a lot of buyers that have good money they just don't qualify for whatever reason with the banks. And so they're happy to have the opportunity that we give them. Mm. All right. Um, I have another question. One of my issues with fl slow flips is there's always a chance that I might need to borrow money against the property. I don't need money now, but you never know. There's might be a time that I need to. Are you open to including a subordination clause into the contract for deed? This means like if I I, pro I purchased the property for 50000 and later sold it using a contract for deed. How would you feel about putting a subordination clause in order to borrow money against the property? How do you feel so, about this? So it's a great question. Now, I personally, I believe I'm all about free and clear. So I would never want to be borrowing against it anyway. But let's assume that's the situation. You absolutely can for two reasons. One, as long as you're borrowing less than the amount that you sold it. If you bought it for fifty. dollars and sold it for 149 
and now it's worth 300, don't be borrowing more than the 149, right? Because that's what the person has to pay you off. So as long as you're borrowing less than that, your end buyer owes you, then you can still do it without a problem. And you don't even really need to subordinate in most states anyway, because it's not even recorded. But if you were recording it or wanted to have it in it, it's no big deal to put it in your contract. I, you know, again, I'm personally not doing it because we, I believe in free and clear. So I never want to borrow against a property. But if you wanted that as a fallback or just in case, absolutely, you can put it in. I would just never borrow more than you're selling it for to your end buyer. All right. Next question. According to the Dodd-Frank Act, if you engage in more than four contracts in a year, you're required to hold a mortgage license underwriter. How do you navigate this if you're not a, a mortgage loan officer or don't have a mortgage loan officer underwriter? So there's multiple different answers for that. And I've spoken with three different attorneys, gotten three different answers. But the one thing everybody can agree on is that you're allowed to do three deals per year per entity. So it's not just three deals per year for you, Chantel, but it's three deals per year per entity. And on top of that, and this is a huge part of our business, there is no regulation when we sell to investors. And probably 80 to 90% of all of our deals are sold to investors. So there's no regulation on top of that. So it's only your homeowner deals that you have to fit into that box. And with that box, it's three per year per entity. So, and then if you, and you can do more than that if you want to, but then you would have to go through the um, underwriting. So it, it, in order to not do the underwriting, just keep it at three per year per entity or sell to investors. So when you say per entity, you mean just put it under another LLC? Correct. Okay, got it. All right. Next question is um, talking about property insurance. Do you allow the buyers to obtain their own insurance policy and then add you as an additional insured party? Or do you retain the insurance policy and then just charge them for it? Give us the pros and cons of doing each. So we require in our new paperwork, we require them to get their own policy. Um, and then we're, we're added as additional insured. So we used to not be able to do that. And some states, we still aren't having luck with it. But in our local market here, we have an insurance company that has they went through our program and they insure all of our people as homeowners. We've had challenges before them where they would call their own insurance company and they say, oh, no, you can only get renter's insurance or you can only get this or that because they're not on title. We do have one company here. And I can tell you, since you're local, it's Choice Insurance. Choice Insurance will insure all of our people as homeowners. Um, we have some situations in other states where we haven't found a company yet who will do it, in which case we will get the policy and pass on the expense to them. So we do it one way or the other. I prefer them to have their own policy, but if we can't find the insurance company who will do it, then we still do it ourselves. So in the context of first right of refusal, so meaning like, let's say you go, I want to make sure I don't sell this property. Let's say it's a property that you love and you don't want to ever get rid of. And you're like, I want to do the first right of refusal. Talk about the pros and cons and describe that a little bit. So I haven't done first right of refusal, but I don't really see any con with it because you're not committing to buy it. You're just having a right to buy it. So I don't see any con with it. A benefit would be, again, if you see a, you know, a house that you were in love with. But I can tell you a real life situation that just happened last month. And I'm going to I'm trying to watch the time because I know we're tight, but I'm going to run you through the numbers. So this was a house that I bought for twenty five thousand dollars. This was on 19th Street in Newport News. And I, I paid twenty five thousand for it. And this had to be oh six, oh seven. It had a small house fire. And when the house fire happened, we had insurance on the property and the insurance company gave me twenty five thousand dollars. So I was like, man, I just bought it for twenty five. They gave me twenty five. So I was going to originally just sell it outright. But then I said, hey, let's see if someone will buy it as a slow flip as is right with the fire damage. It wasn't much. It was mostly all smoke damage except for the kitchen. So anyway, so I sold it really cheap to the guy who ended up buying it. I think I sold it for thirty nine thousand and he was only paying me like four hundred dollars a month. But he's been there like 10 years now. Right. Well, about a month ago, he calls me and he says, hey, I just wanted to see what's the process if I'm going to go ahead and sell this thing. And I said, no problem. You, some agents will let you list it as a contract owner. And some agents will ask me to sign the um, listing agreement. Either way, I'll assist with whatever you need. And then I said, well, by the way, how much are you, what are you planning on selling it for? And he was like, well, I was thinking I could probably get 75,000 for it. And I was like, whoa, whoa hold up. You know, <laughs> so I was like, wait a second. So, so is that what you're going to sell it for? Do you want to sell it for 75? Well, he ended up agreeing to sell it to me for 65,000. 
Now, keep in mind, it was it was an odd deal because I still have the deed. I still own the property and yet I'm buying it now. He owed me about 30, I think 35. And so I actually gave him a check for $30,000 just to sign a release. So it felt really weird. I'm like, I'm buying a house, but I already own it. But um, but it was basically like you said, with the first right of refusal, because I the way I looked at it, I said, if this house was listed today for 70,000, would I buy it? And I'm like, hands down 100% without thinking twice about it. So then why would I not buy it from this guy, right? He's going to end up selling it to a stranger or I can just pay him, which is what I did. So I paid him, he signed the release, and now I own my own property again, which we've resold since. Let's talk about seller financing. So when you seller financing, what is the percentage that you have come back or default on purchase? So like if you had to get just out of 100 properties, how many of those are defaulting and not paying? And what do you do about getting that property back and how much of a hassle is it? So out of a hundred, I would say we probably might get back about 15. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't file on more than that. And by file, you know what I mean? They're late, we file, but we, I have a strict rule that we will cancel any, we will cancel any court proceeding, any eviction, anything, as long as they pay up, even if it's the day of eviction or the day of court, we will always cancel everything. I never, I know people that are like, well, they've been late three times. I want to evict them. And I'm like, no, we will, they'll be late a thousand times and we'll still never evict anybody unless they just obviously default and don't make any payments. It is not a big process in our states that we invest in. And we pick those states because we only want to invest in landlord friendly states. So in the states, much like in Virginia, it's, it's a regular, it's the same process as a tenant eviction. There are other states where you have to go through a foreclosure process. And so we will not invest in those states, except like Ohio and Illinois, you have to go through a foreclosure process after they've paid down 20% of their of the purchase price. So the way I look at it is 20% of the purchase price is going to take them about 10 years. If they made it 10 years, then I'm fine. Yes, we would have to go through an eviction. But um, most of the states we invest in, they don't even have that clause where you can just do a regular eviction, same as if it was a tenant. Okay. Um, another question is on the example he gave a $66,000 house that sold for 240,000. We first need the 66,000 laying below a mattress to start in Las Vegas. There's no properties on or near that price. Do you use a line of credit or how do you get that money? So for that particular one, I use my own money, but the way we normally do the entire business is through private lenders. And so, and that is why I keep my numbers the way they are with $30,000 houses and $50,000 houses, because with a private lender, and I'll give you real math, if you borrow $50,000 from a private lender, we pay 12% interest. And I know that's a lot of interest, but short-term amortization, it doesn't come out to that bad. On a 12% mortgage for 60 months, it comes out to $1,112.22. And then it's free and clear on the 61st month. And so we, we do almost everything with private lenders. People that they loan the money, they make a 12% return. We make a monthly payment to them for 60 payments and the 61st payment, it's free and clear. So that's how you do the deals without having the money lying under your bed. And as far as being in Vegas and you're not going to get any deals in that price point, there's nothing you can do about that other than look outside of your market. And, and the more you do it outside of your market, the more comfortable you'll be, comf the more comfortable you will become with it. And then it'll become a non-issue. I, I remember I was completely uncomfortable with even considering outside of my market. And now I can buy anywhere in the country and I don't think twice about it. So um, I, I am interested in doing some lending. And so tell, what are the tips do you have for someone who's looking to lend money? Like if, if I was going to lend money, what would I do? Cause my first reaction is, I want to lend money in the state of Virginia because obviously, and even in my market, because I know that market really well. So if you were going to give tips to someone who wanted to actually lend the money, what would those tips be for you? So twofold. So one is I typical lenders that we use are not people like yourself, Shante, who are active in real estate or active in the business. They're just older people that have money in their bank account and they'd rather make a 12% return than a 5% or a 4% return. And so I manage everything for them as far as vetting. If they're lending to one of my coaching students, I'll, I'll vet the property for them and I'll make sure that it, you know, it, it's a property that I would buy for the same amount. 
if you are somebody active like yourself, Chantel, the biggest advice I give anybody who's a, who's a new lender and they are active is, I, and I, I do this when I lend myself, I say, well, I'd never lend on anything I wouldn't buy for that amount of money. And that's the way, that's the way I always do it when I lend. I said, hey, if somebody wants to borrow 100 grand on this, would I buy that thing for 100 grand? Because in essence, I might be, right? And so that's, if you're active in the business, I always say, as long as you would buy it for that price, then I'd feel comfortable lending. Um, if not, then I wouldn't. And, and then for the in, inactive lenders, I do that for them. I, I vet them for them. So what are the states? So you kind of said, you know, we've done some research search on the states that you think are the best to buy these type of properties. What are the states that you think are the best? The states that we're doing a lot in now is going to be Missouri, Illinois, Ohio, Alabama. We do a lot in Alabama. Those four are probably the highest concentration of deals right now. It is amazing to me. And there's a lot of my, I haven't invested in Indiana. I saw somebody commented a lot of my guys do invest in Indiana. It is amazing to me. We live in a bubble, right? And we know what we, what we see for this price point. I will see houses like in my group that they paid $17,000 for. And I look at it and I'm like, it's a beautiful ranch. It looks moving ready. And then they'll get it sold at 89,900 a month. And I'm like, oh God, do the math. You paid $17,000, it's crazy. But that's because we live in a bubble and we see everything the way we see it in our local market. When you start expanding out and looking and you're just bored, go online and you can type in Illinois and go in Zillow, houses under 50,000 and start looking at them and you'll be amazed with what comes up. And um, it's 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 amazing what's out there in the country. But again, we all live in a bubble and we think that we know price points, but we do. We know our local market. It's amazing what else is out there. All right. Last question. So Indiana requires the full foreclosure process on land contracts. Do some states require full foreclosure process or do some have an easier or a partial process? So most, see, I don't know Indiana because I haven't invested in Indiana yet, but most of the states that we're in, we do just a regular for a regular eviction process, except when they pay down 20%, in which case then, and, and Alabama requires foreclosure also, and, and without the 20%. And yes, it's a full process. It's a full process. In Alabama, it's inexpensive, but in like in Virginia, to do a foreclosure, it costs you around $5,000. So I even do some regular financing here in Virginia. Somebody wants the deed in their name. And the way I do that is I require them to pay an additional $5,000 down. And I tell them it's because you have a default. It's going to cost me another $5,000 to get the house back. And, and they'll do it. And I don't mind. You know, I don't mind. I want the deed in their name. It's less on me then. And um, so as long as they're willing to put down the other 5,000, then I'm fine with it. And every state might be different for what the um, foreclosures cost. I know in Alabama, they're very inexpensive and quick. Like here, it might take you a few months. In Alabama, it's like six weeks for the whole process. So, um, so then you'll obviously research that state and what the foreclosure costs are and timelines. So yeah, quickly, just explain the having the deed in their name and explain what is the foreclosure process? So like if someone, let's just say in Virginia, if someone wanted to foreclose, give us kind of what is the nightmare that they'd have to go through? So it's not a nightmare. Basically, we just hire an attorney. You hire an attorney. The attorney has to publish it, which is kind of a scam. They have to publish it twice in the paper. Nobody reads the paper anymore, but yet the papers charge you like $2,000 to publish this little classified. Why? Because it's the law that you have to publish it and they can. That's it. There's no reason that it should cost two thousand dollars to publish a little classified ad, but they know the law requires it to be published, and they're the only paper left. So they're like, "Eh, you have no choice." So, um, so the the lawyer who you hire then would publish it twice in the paper, and then on the date that it's stated in the paper, they will have a, a an auction at the courthouse steps, and if anyone shows up to bid on it, as long as it bids over what you're owed, it'll sell, and if it bids below what you're owed, where you started at, then it reverts back to ownership back to you. Mm, wow. And then explain the deed in their name. Like if they want the deed in their name, explain what that process looks like. So as long as you've owned it for more than a year, and the reason I say over a year is because if you transfer the deed in less than a year, the IRS wants to tax you on the full amount of gain, even though you didn't get it. So let's assume you waited over a year, you owned it over a year. If you deed it to them, now the deed shows up in their name and you are just a note in deed of trust, just like a Bank of America would be on a house if you got a mortgage from them. The deeds in their name, they could they could refi, they can get a equity line, they can do anything. They own the property and you are just a mortgage payment. That's it. And if they ever default, then you would have the same rights as Bank of America would and you would file a foreclosure. But you're not getting any notices for the grass being high. You're not involved in anything. You're not an owner of the property anymore. So what percentages 
of your houses do you put the deed in their name and what are the pros and cons of doing that? I do very few, only if they want to. The reason I'll do them is if somebody has to put 30, 40, 50 grand into it, sometimes they're nervous and rightfully so that I'm going to spend 50 grand and I don't even have the deed. And if they're talking to me about it or concerned, I will tell them, you can't have the deed, but this is the way we need to do it. I just want additional money down to protect me if they had to default. So the only con is if they were to default, you have to go through foreclosure. That's it. Um, the pros, I like all the pros. The pros is it's, it's not yours anymore. There's no more liability whatsoever for you. You are just an additional assured on the policy. It's no longer your house. You're just the bank, which is kind of our goal with the whole process anyway. Well, tell listeners where they can find you, where they can follow you, and where they can get your amazing book. Well, if they haven't um, listened to the first two, I, I was giving everybody a free copy of the book, The Art of the Slow Flip, and they can just get it by going to slowflip.com, S-L-O-W-F-L-I-P.com, and just pay shipping and handling. Other than that, I'm on all socials under my name, Scott Jelinek, so it makes it, uh, it, makes it real easy. Awesome. Well, this has been amazing. You give such a wealth of knowledge. Thanks for being with us today, Scott. You are very welcome. Have a fantastic day and look forward to talking to you soon. Yes. Thanks so much. And you guys, if you want the checklist that we put together, you can go to joincanzel.com slash slow flip and get that checklist that we put together. It gives you just kind of an idea of some of the things we we've gotten from his book and kind of wrote it down that it just makes it really easy to look at that checklist. All right. Thanks for being with us. I'm Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave a rating and a review so we can get this out to more agents and tune in next week for another power pack episode. This is the millionaire real estate podcast.